live. Hi everyone, welcome to the uh, live um, from Donate for Refugees. I'm really sorry about the delay, there were some technical issues on my side. <laughs> um, so my name is Sophie, um, I'm going to be interviewing Sally Hyman today um, from Cribs International. Um, I've been a volunteer in, a number of times uh, in Greece, once with Cribs International itself. Um, and I actually live just up the road from Sally, which is very coincidental. I didn't know that uh, when I first got back from Greece the first time. Um, I found this out um, just via online Facebook chats through uh, Rando, who some of you may know. Uh, and me and Sally realised that we lived very close to each other and it was really nice to know that there was someone so locally, uh, yeah. living so locally, so supporting refugees in this way. So we'll get started with Sally. Um, Sally, do you want to start off by telling us uh, a little bit about yourself and about Crips? Okay, so hi everybody. I'm Sally from Cribs and um, I'm a 61 year old retired teacher. Um, I live in Oldham in Lancashire in the UK and I went to Greece in 2016 um, very nervous just after the borders closed and I worked in a camp in Ritzona camp and while I was there I saw that the conditions that people were expected to live in, anybody was expected to live in, was were just awful. They were truly, truly awful. And I think most of the people watching this will know that they were truly, truly awful. I mean, the, the food was terrible. There were no showers worth speaking of. I think there were four for 2,000 people. Um, water supply was limited. There were snakes and rats and you name it. And people were coming back to their... I uh, expected to come back to there after they'd had their baby, often with the cesarean section, and to live in a tent. And it wasn't right. So one of the things that I did when I came home after my brain had kind of got back into the rest of my body and I recovered slightly was I started cribs along with some other people. It, it wasn't it wasn't intended to be what it is now, but maybe that's a good thing because I think I might have been terrified. Um, but but cribs was born, if you like, in the idea of a refugee camp not being a place that's okay for, for women to live with their babies. Um, and what we do now, um, we have housed in the last four years, three years, three and a half years, we've housed 50 families for over a year, some of them, um, well, quite a few of them for over a year, actually. Um, we take women who are pregnant in the third trimester, um, who don't have any other health issues. And obviously a lot of refugee women do have other health issues. So we will take women who are pregnant at any point if they've got health problems. So they may have something ordinary and normal like gestational diabetes, which is not, not any fun and dangerous. Um, or they may have, I think we've had somebody who had um, thalassemia, which is an inherited disease. Um, and we house them, we provide them with basic stuff um, we also take women with with small babies as well who who may be sleeping in the park and in the church and we give them somewhere to live and it's as basic as that except it's not absolutely so not only do you provide a roof over uh the heads of, of these fam of the families that you support um but you also have um workers out there offering a, a lot more support as well don't you yeah, so when we first started, we just did housing. Basically, we didn't, we were very green. We didn't really know what we were doing. We just knew we wanted to do something to help. Um, and we just provided accommodation. And gradually over the years, with input from other volunteers, people like Sophie, who came out and worked for us for, for three weeks, and, and <laughs> we nearly broke her. Um, we, we now have three workers, one of whom is a psychologist, um, who support women during pregnancy and labour um, as much as they're able to give in the Greek system and with breastfeeding afterwards as well. Um, they support them through the legal process, which is labyrinthine. It's Greek. It's really difficult and it's stacked against people. Um, and we support with, with breastfeeding input. We're very, very pro breastfeeding. In the same way, we're also very pro um, we believe that, that reproductive rights 
should be accessible to all women, refugees or no. So birth control and abortion, we will do what we can to support women in those situations as well. Um, we also have a free shop, which is, um, maybe we talk a bit more in detail about that later, but the free shop exists to provide um, donations, clothes and all sorts of things that women need um, in Athens. Fantastic. Um, so what is the situation that these uh, that the women uh, are facing when they come to you at Cribs? Um, where are they living um, when they get in touch with you and what situation are they in? Uh, very often we receive messages from families, either on from women on Facebook or on WhatsApp, and they say, um, it's usually in French uh, these days because so many of the women are from Congo and Cameroon, and they say, um, please help me, I'm frightened for my baby, I'm living in the park or the church or the street, or I'm living in a room with 10 other people and they're all men, um, and I need somewhere to live. And that that's how they come to us. They are, they're living in the park, they're sleeping on the benches, um, they're living in, in front of the church and sleeping on the, the cold stone, which is not okay for anybody. Um, and they, they may be pregnant or they may have a new baby and they're really, really vulnerable. I mean, I don't like using the word vulnerable because like the women that we house are survivors. You know, they've, they've managed to get away from a really difficult situation in their home country. They've managed to escape trafficking, sex trafficking or um, family murder. They managed to survive that and they make the journey and it's a hell of a journey. I mean, anybody who's read, oh, Sophie, what's the name of that amazing book? Um, ah, can't remember. Um, but a Hope it, More Powerful Than the Sea. Mm, maybe, but if you read any of the books about the journey, you kind of go, oh my God, I didn't even know how awful the journey was. So they, they survived the journey and then they get to Athens and they're faced with homelessness, hunger, heat, cold, mosquito bites, um, rape. It's a big, big problem, really huge problem. Forced sex work. And most of the women that, that we house have been have faced that. Um, eating out of bins when you're seven months pregnant. It's not okay. It's just not okay. I mean, you don't have to be a rabid feminist um, to know that that is not okay. So. Those are the sorts of things people are facing. They're also facing eviction from Greek authority accommodation. Mm -hmm. If you get your refugee status, within one month, you lose your housing and your income from the Greek government and the UNHCR. And this is fact, you know, however you want to read it, this is, this is the reality. And you're on the streets and with nothing with just nothing, with relying on volunteer organisations to provide you with food. So you've gone from having your own bathroom and all the rest of it to living in Victoria Square and being scooped up by the police um, and taken somewhere in the middle of nowhere to to a camp that's not winterised. That means, you know, like people are living in tents in the winter. You know, it's, I like camping, but that's not camping. You know, no, you're, you're, absolutely. you're, you're sleeping in, in hard, cold ground. There's no medical care worth speaking of. Um, there's no education for your kids. There's no future. So, I mean, Cribs doesn't work with a huge number of people. I wish we did. I really, really wish we could work with an enormous number of people. But the people that we do work with, we give them time and space to turn their lives around. Absolutely. And that was the, the next question I was coming to is what does it mean um, to the to the women and um, the, the families that you support to have this roof over the heads? Um, do you want to go into a bit more about what that means for them? Yeah, so on a practical front, it's very hard to imagine, really, um, if you're like me and have always had housing security. But if you're sleeping in the park, you don't have a place to get clean. You know, you don't have a place to prepare food. You don't have anything except the things around you that you can protect. 
So imagine going from that to having your own front door that you can close and you're safe to having your own bathroom where, you know, if it's hot and sweaty or you've got your period or just, hey, like we all like to have a shower every day. Um, or you can bath your baby where you can wash your clothes. All the flats have got washing machines so people can keep clean. Keeping clean is, is about as basic to me as it gets. Fed, clean, safe um, is, is, is what we provide. We also make sure that, I mean, everybody has a kitchen. They may share it, but they have a kitchen. And it's so important, not only for your physical well-being to be able to prepare decent food, but mentally to be able to have food that represents your, your home country. Um, you know, the, the, in the camps, people get food, we call it food. It's not always food. It's, mm. it's horrible. And it's nothing to do with where people have come from um, and what they're used to eating. You know, yourself, if you're homesick, what are you homesick for? Mars mm. bar, you know, Hi. <laughs> basic <laughs> pie. Yeah, OK. Yeah, a good cup of tea. Um, and that's, we, we can joke about that. But we haven't got a future of an endless future of not being able to eat the things that we're used to eating. And it's so important and so comforting for people to be able to cook absolutely and it's and again it comes back to dignity doesn't it it's um them being able to cook for themselves and have have that choice as well exactly so once people have the front door and their bathroom and their kitchen and and able to cook and, and money coming in so families that don't have cash cards um we provide them with a stipend and where we get donations where we can afford it we provide nappies and, and medicines as well um so for those families, um, if you know, we are we are able to to give them that level of security, and then they can start to rebuild their lives. Whether they want to rebuild their lives in Greece or not, okay, you know, not everybody wants to stay in Greece, that's for sure. But I'm thinking about one particular family. They were able to get their kids into school, and now their kids speak fluent Greek. Um, other people were, were able to, to get to classes, to learn things, to go to psychologists, to heal, to begin to heal. I mean, it's a big process and a lifelong process, really. Um, and if you've got the foundation layer, I wasn't going to mention Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but bit highfalutin, but to me, it's like if you have that bottom layer of your own front door and food and basic safety, you can start to rebuild the rest of your life. And, and I think that's what we do best in cribs absolutely it's it's life-changing really for for um the families that that do get this support yeah fantastic and what are some of the challenges that you face in in doing this work i'm sure there are many do you want to touch on a few of those um yes i think the worst thing the, the most difficult thing um is hearing from somebody who says I'm sleeping in the park and it's 35 degrees and I'm going to have a baby in two months and and you go actually there's nothing I can do all our accommodation is full all our money is counted for maybe I can refer them to to Amartel to another organization Maybe I can put a shout out and see if anybody's got any spare money. But we're all, all of us in, in refugee work, we're all really, really pushed. And I think all our friends are <laughs> being asked and asked and asked so many times. So the hardest thing is saying, I'm really sorry, but there's absolutely nothing I can do. And repeatedly saying that because, you know, as I said before, the people we help are survivors. So they will just keep asking. And I would do the same thing. And that, that hurts not as much as, you know, Obviously, it's far, far, far immeasurably worse for the people who are suffering it. But to to go to bed at night and not, actually, I wasn't able to do anything today. It's really tough, and it's tough for our team in, in Athens as well. It's tough for all of us. Absolutely, I know. I experienced that when I was out with you for the three or four weeks of having to make those choices between supporting a woman who is sleeping on the uh, in the park, a woman who's sleeping in a church, and um, etc and that's uh, really difficult decisions to have to make but as a small NGO of course you can only help so many people um, yeah. so absolutely and um, I mean and when we do I, I know we, we Sophie and I planned this a wee bit in advance and that um, 
I was going to to talk a little bit about a couple of families who who have done really well just as an example of what what can happen um there's there's one mum who was sleeping in the park and seven months pregnant and we squoze her in we made space we didn't really have space she, she slept on a i think initially she slept on a, a sofa in the, in the hall of a flat because we just felt we couldn't leave her where she was um and we also paid a little bit extra at the hospital for her to have a room on her own and decent support and she messaged us after she'd had the baby saying this is the first time in my life in Greece since I've been here that anybody has treated me with respect like the Greeks and not with racism. Um, she went on to successfully breastfeed her baby. I think she's still feeding the baby now, um, who's over a year, um, to go to classes, to get certificates in Greek and to learn better English and to learn computers. And about a month ago, she moved into her own flat I and mean, we, we paid the deposit so that she could get started and you know she, she's she's doing really really well and we're really chuffed and she's not the only one um she's just one that i i picked in it in advance and then another another family um they were they were being um abused actually by a couple who uh, were fundraising ostensibly to to pay this family's rent but actually the money was being used to pay their own rent the couple's rent um the, the family were were full of lice and bed bugs they had they were infested it was ghastly um and we got them their own place i remember seeing them the day after we 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 gave them some money to, to go and get themselves sorted and it had a haircut and a shower and had some new clothes on and I hardly recognised them. You know, the dignity had come back. And yeah. you know, that, that's what we do. We give people a chance to have their dignity back. Um and um we got the kids into school and it was a major fight, but we did it. We got the kids into school and the dad got a job and now they've got their passports and hopefully, all being well, they won't be staying in Greece because that's what they want to do. They want to leave and go to Germany. So fantastic. Things not everything works out. I mean, if, if I were to say that everything was a sweet and rosy story like that for all the families, you know, nobody would believe me and, and it would be right. But for a lot of people, things come out well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think at this present time, it would be difficult to have this um, discussion without asking perhaps how COVID has impacted on um, your work and the impact it's it's had on on the families that you support um do you want to touch on that a little bit perhaps how it might have affected the, the free shop for example yes so our free shop is is tiny and it's full of stuff um so it actually has become impossible excuse me i'm going to cough <coughs> um it's become impossible to distribute the way we used to so we used to invite people in um, and tell them how much stuff they could take and um, and they would they would have choice of, of what they took, like an ordinary shopping trip. But because of COVID, we've decided that we can't do that. So now what we do is we prepare packs. People message us, we prepare packs, and then we distribute the packs. So people are still able to get their stuff. I'm sorry, I'm going to have a really bad coughing fit. So Don't worry, that's that. fine. We can, we can let you do that. Um, what Sal is explaining is that... <laughs> um, you may put your microphone on mute for Sally if you want to have a short coughing fit <laughs> and I can fill in for a moment. Go on, fill um, in for a minute. Yeah, <laughs> I know that um, the free shop is still operating in a sense of um, they have someone there that is able to pack up um, the items needed for families and get them to families safely. Um uh, in in line with with COVID regulations, um, so that people still have access to those items, um, but they are obviously unfortunately not able to go into the free shop at the moment to actually choose the items. Is that right, Sally? Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, one of, one of the things that is so important is that people have the opportunity to choose their own stuff, and we can't do that at the minute, and we're really sorry. But we we learnt a while back um, about distribution and how important it is that people at least receive things not in a black plastic bag. Yeah. 
if you give somebody their clothes in a bin bag, what does that say? What you think of them? So, you know, it's we, just we, the little things that make a, a big difference because, in that sense, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it really matters. And we're really lucky um, to have volunteers who understand all this stuff um, and, and will do their best. We'll, we'll bend over backwards to make sure that people are treated with respect. Absolutely. Um, and so you you have volunteers out in Athens and, and workers as uh, as well. Um, what are some of the ways that they um, support uh, the the women and, and the families? Um, before I answer that, I'd like to say that Cribs does not work in a vacuum. We work with other organisations, small ones like um, the Otima, who specialise in working with, with women who've suffered from gender-based violence. We work with Amartel, who are um, antenatal and, and postnatal specialists. We work with MVI, who are an amazing bunch of people and who, who answer the phone at all hours of the day and night, and they're fantastic, they're a medical team. So we, we work with them, um, and we are we are able to uh, to refer to them so our our team in athens um works alongside these other organizations they will the, so the team meets with each family every week obviously when it's possible um and encourages them in accessing education in in making sure i mean uh, sorry this does sound a little bit patronizing just making sure that they're looking after the flats okay because sometimes, you know, if, if somebody's been through hell and back and they're quite depressed or they, they're exhausted from the babies and, you know, they, they don't. And, and that's a problem for, for everybody. We support them through hospital visits um, and where possible through birthing their baby. So last night, good timing, um, last night, one of our team who wishes to remain anonymous and wonderful wonderful human being um spent the day before going backwards and forwards to the different hospitals um with the mum because they wanted to do a cesarean section on the mum and the mum wasn't sure and she got a second opinion went into labor naturally yesterday which was wonderful and um unfortunately needed to have a cesarean section at the end but the person who works with us who doesn't want to be named took her to those appointments took her to, was, was with her until gone midnight last night, wasn't actually allowed in the birthing room. You're not allowed to keep somebody company in Greece. I don't get it, but hey. Um, and today went back to the hospital and argued and fought <laughs> for that mum to be with her baby. She was an advocate. And we find that women who have advocacy suffer less racism, suffer fewer cesarean sections, have more successful breastfeeding outcomes. And those are, that's a big deal. I mean, apart from all the physical stuff, to have that advocacy and to have somebody with you to empower you to be able to do what you can do for yourself, that, that's what the team do in Athens. And it's great. They're, they're just fantastic people. Absolutely. Um, I know myself, I accompanied a, a woman to some hospital appointments and um it's it's incredibly difficult not knowing the language for a start mm. and um the, the greek uh, alphabet etc to to get around yeah. the hospital so having people in and, and who can act as translators and be a support to those women is is amazing amazing yeah. um that's fantastic I mean, we shouldn't we shouldn't have to do that but the fact mm. is that it does have to be done i mean i i hope very fervently that one day um the greek hospitals will enter the 21st century um, in terms of maternity care and will allow people to be mobile in labour and will support them better in breastfeeding. I'm not by any manner of means saying all Greek hospitals, all Greek doctors, all Greek midwives, but I do know from experience that it, it's very much stacked against women um, and, I, and I hope that, that things do change in the future to make birthing in Greece um, a better experience. Mm. Absolutely. 
Um, so I'm sure that everyone that's listening um, to this today will um, be really impressed by the support that you're giving and it's absolutely necessary. Um, do you want to explain a bit about how you managed to provide this housing and support and also perhaps how people that are listening to this could help? I'd love to. <laughs> yes. Um, how do we manage to do it? Well, we, I, I really have to say this because they're hosting it, but we do have amazing support from Donate for Refugees who have bailed us out of difficult situations more time than I care to remember. Uh, so to Amber, who's in the background there and didn't want to come on screen and, and all her team, big thank you from us for all your support. You're, you're a great lot. Um, we have a few grants. We occasionally get very rarely approached by somebody saying, hey, I want to give you some money. And that's wonderful. You know, it's a champagne day in my eyes. Most of the time, short of taking my clothes off, which I won't do because it wouldn't get us any money. Um, it's about selling things, running auctions, asking, explaining, um, and not quite begging, but you know, we, we really, really have to push to to get the money in. Last night, as well as having a new baby into cribs, which was great. We also finished our auction. Um, I think the person that runs it will kill me if I actually tell the secret of how much we raised, but it was way more than we thought we were going to get, especially with COVID. So we we, we have events. Um, next week, I think Amber's in on this as well, is going to be um, the big give. So if you would like to support what we do, and you want to give a one-off donation, please donate through the Big Give um, and you can have your money matched if you do it at the right time. I think it has to be at midday, or as close to midday as you can to donate. Um, keep an eye on our Facebook and Instagram and somebody else does all that scary stuff. But yeah, it'll, it'll all the details will be there. We also recently had a very, very heartwarming donation from a lady called Charlotte, a woman called Charlotte. Um, it was a bit odd. This this strange amount of money appeared in the bank from somebody we didn't know. And I managed to find her and said, Look, could we claim gift aid on this? Yes. And by the way, why is it this odd amount of money? She said, I'm a recently qualified midwife. I'm not earning a lot of money, but I would like to donate an hour's worth of my pay each month to Cribs because I can manage that much. And it's just wonderful, um, you know, to, to, I think, I know COVID's tough and I know a lot of people are really struggling and I'm not asking you, I'm, I wish you all the best in getting through this mess. But if you can afford an hour's worth of your pay each month to donate to Cribs on a regular basis, that would be amazing because then we can plan. With regular income, we can plan if we can afford a new flat. Um, we can plan if we can afford to take another two families out of the park or off the street. Um, so those are those are two of the ways that you can help immediately right now. And the other thing that we've we've turned to um, in the last few months with with COVID because of the community fundraising, we haven't been able to do that. Um, is birthday fundraisers on Facebook have been an absolute godsend. So if you've got a birthday coming up and you are on Facebook, as most of the world is, I think these days, um, please do a birthday fundraiser for Cribs and raise a hundred pounds or 150 pounds. And you know, you've paid someone's rent for, well, depends on the flat, but you, you could pay for, for one mum, you could pay her rent for the month. And um, that's, that's a good way to spend your birthday. Absolutely. And that's a, a massive impact as well. And I think that's one of the things I found while volunteering with you is seeing how directly that that money goes to to supporting the families to to get in, um, you know, an extra flat or a push chair or something like that, that, yeah. um, you know, we've we've fundraised for in the past. And hopefully once COVID is um, more behind us, we will mm -hmm. be able to go back to doing the the community events and things. And I know I myself ran a, a fashion fundraiser yeah. and we had great a, night. a great night. It was it was brilliant. And it's just doing things like that that um, take a little bit of effort. But the impact that that has is just huge. And it's been really nice to see the Cribs auction as well. And if there is anyone 
um, that's interested in that, they, they run, is it twice a year, Sally, that you do yeah. the auctions? Yeah, um, any so more than that with Rachel. So yeah. <laughs> Another one in the spring that you can look out for, and if you are a crafter or a maker, you can you can donate things or pre pre loved items. Um, and yes, yeah, so there are different ways. And I think uh, the the more that we come together in doing these these small things and donating small amounts makes the work that Sally and the team are doing possible. Yes, and I think what we need to remember is that what might be for us okay, we don't have a pizza. Or whatever that that means that somebody else is is off the street somebody's home is safe somebody's baby is is safe and that to me that's that's the bottom line that that's what makes this worth this work worth doing and um and sophie and i were talking about this earlier i think we both feel very blessed to have the opportunity to do it absolutely um, I'm going to look now to see and ask if anyone has any questions before we finish off and get um, a final uh, word from, from Sally. Does anyone have any questions at all? And I will try to see uh, if there's anything coming up. I don't see anything just yet. Yeah. Uh, oh, now I see them all. <laughs> um, oh, okay, fantastic. Hi, everyone. Um, I must have been uh, clicked on the wrong, <laughs> the wrong moment before. Katie says hi, mum. <laughs> hello, boss from Joe. And um, so we've got lots of of hellos. Um, hi everyone, good to see you all there. Joe has actually commented that the auction has raised over five and a half thousand pounds and it is growing. Mm -hmm. So Sally, I know you'll be really pleased to, to hear that. I'm comment. running out of words and that's not my usual style at all. <laughs> yeah, uh, there is a question from uh, Alyssa on here. Um, to Sally, I know that you house for a year. What happens after that? That's a really good question, Alyssa, and something Sally can try. Oops, we seem to have lost Sophie. Um, I can answer your question though, Alyssa. Um, it's our biggest problem. Moving people on is definitely our biggest problem. And what we try to do is either um, find another organisation to support them um, or make sure that they've got some income from um, another, another place or often people will get themselves sorted out as well. But it's really tricky. It's really, really difficult to know um, that everybody's going to be safe. It's it's not the case. We do what we can. We don't chuck people out on the street on their kids' first birthday by any manner of means. And, and um, we also have some flats in um, outside of Athens in Rafina where people can stay until their kids are two. Um, but moving families on is our biggest problem. And I, I can't give you a single answer. Um, we are we are working with. Ooh, quick check notes, action for women. Um, so the, the classes that are, some of the women go to are action for women classes, and they are hoping to help with our housing and moving on people and employment, but not everybody. And um, Alyssa, if you've got any, <laughs> if you've got any answers to, um, or any thoughts on, on how we can work better on this, I would be, I would be grateful that anybody does. Alyssa Thanks. said thank you for that. Um, sorry, I think you lost me there for a moment. We didn't, Sophie. Got you. Uh, whew, <laughs> these technical well things. <laughs> um, okay, uh, thank you for that question, Alyssa. That was a really good point and one that mm. I know we talk about uh, a lot <laughs> in Chris. Yeah. Um, so um, I'll just check to see if there are any other questions at all. Thank you. Amber's added in there into the chat how you can um help uh, Sally and, and support the cribs work um with some easy points there um so I can't see any more questions at the moment Sally do you want to just round up and, and finish off anything else you want to say thank you um well first of all thanks to Sophie for for putting herself through this um I think it's really important to remember that that this is teamwork Cribs is teamwork. I'm I'm here because I'm the front of it. But um, you know, there's there's 30, 40 people who who keep the thing afloat. Um and that's that, you know, it, it's important to know that. Otherwise I'd be feeling a bit of a fraud sitting here. Mm -hmm. And when when we when we have somebody, we 
can change the life for one person. Let's make that more than one person. Let's just keep finding places for people to live and finding the money for it too. That's it. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you for your support today. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'll just double check we've we've not got any more questions. I think, yeah, that's that's all. And the next uh, live with Donate for Refugees will be on the 13th of December um, with Caroline Kerr from Bras Not Bombs. Um, she'll be interviewed by Katie Richards. Um, keep a check on the Donate for Refugees uh, Facebook page and all the times and the link to join, etc. will be on there. So thank you so much. It's great to hear from you, Sally. And thank you for everyone uh, for joining and to Amber for organising this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.